Since first arriving at the Kennedy Space Center 25 years ago, Space Shuttle Atlantis has made the four-mile trek from KSE's Vehicle Assembly Building to its Oceanside launch pads more than 30 times. The fourth of NASA's five orbiters, Atlantis's career has not been lacking in firsts. Among them, the first shuttle to deploy a probe to another planet, the first shuttle to dock to a space station, and the first shuttle to fly with a glass cockpit. And now, Atlantis will lead the shuttle fleet to a final first, as it becomes the first space shuttle to complete its scheduled flights. Atlantis will return to Earth to stay following its mission on STS-132. The array of missions Atlantis has flown is as wide as the oceans once sailed by the 20th century research vessel for which it was named. Atlantis has flown missions for national security, for interplanetary exploration, and to foster international cooperation. On October 3rd, 1985, Atlantis launched from Pad 39A on its maiden voyage, STS-51J. Ignition and liftoff, liftoff of Atlantis. A new orbiter joins the shuttle fleet and it has cleared the tower. Commanded by shuttle veteran Carol Bobko, the classified Department of Defense flight was the first of five Pentagon missions Atlantis completed. After traveling more than a million miles, Atlantis landed at Edwards Air Force Base just four days later on October 7th. Later that year, on just its second flight, Atlantis set a shuttle record for the least amount of time between missions. On November 26th, the orbiter headed back to space on STS-61B, just 50 days after completing its previous flight. Making his first space flight on that crew was mission specialist and spacewalker Jerry Ross, whose seven career space flights, including five on board Atlantis, would set a record matched by just one other astronaut, Three communication satellites were deployed during the flight. During two spacewalks, Ross and Woody Spring also conducted a construction experiment to demonstrate the feasibility of assembling large structures in space. The successful experiment was an early proving ground for the engineering and construction of future space stations. During the next three years, Atlantis flew just one mission. The tragic loss of Space Shuttle Challenger and its crew in January 1986 prompted the grounding of Atlantis and the rest of the shuttle fleet until September 1988. In 1989, Atlantis was back in action completing two missions to provide a closer look at two neighboring planets. The primary payload for STS-30 in May of that year was the Magellan spacecraft, designed to capture radar images of Venus. Magellan, which was the first interplanetary spacecraft launched from a space shuttle, eased into orbit around Venus in August 1990 mapping 98% of the planet before its mission came to an end in October 1994. Five months later, on STS-34, Atlantis was back in space for the deployment of the Galileo spacecraft on its voyage to Jupiter. It took six years for Galileo to arrive at the solar system's largest planet, and when it did, it became the first spacecraft to both orbit and release a probe to penetrate through the atmosphere of an outer planet. It collected data on Jupiter and its moons for the next eight years. And flight crew, this is OTC. Close and lock your visors. Initiate O2 flow. Godspeed on the 100th U.S. manned mission in space. 
On June 27, 1995, Atlantis embarked on a mission which significantly expanded the new era of international cooperation. Two, one, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Atlantis on a mission that will herald a new day of international cooperation in space. Houston now controlling. STS-71 was the third mission of the Shuttle Mir program, but Atlantis, whose crew included cosmonauts Anatoly Soloviev and Nikolai Budarin, became the first shuttle to dock with the Russian space station Mir. After 20 years, our spacecraft are docked in orbit again. Our new era of space exploration has begun. The crews conducted a host of biomedical investigations and transferred equipment. The mission also marked the first on-orbit exchange of shuttle crew members. Astronaut Norm Thagard, and cosmonauts Vladimir Dzhurov and Gennady Strakalov, who flew to Mir on a Russian Soyuz vehicle, returned to Earth on board Atlantis. In a complex orbital ballet, Soloviev and Budarin captured these images from their Russian Soyuz, which undocked just minutes before Atlantis departed Mir. The union of Atlantis and Mir created the largest spacecraft to orbit the Earth at that time. Just about time for the Spirit of 76 to wake up the space show, so have a great flight. All right, we'll put that in work. Thanks very much. Three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Atlantis on the third Shuttle Mir docking flight. Atlantis visited Mir on its next six flights. The crew of the STS-76 mission in March of 1996 included Shannon Lucid, who became the first American woman to live on Mir. Her 188-day stay on board the station set an American long-duration spaceflight record at the time, a record for most days in space by a woman, and initiated a continuous U.S. presence on Mir for the next two years. And astronauts Linda Godwin and Rich Clifford completed the first U.S. spacewalk around two docked vehicles while wearing jet backpacks known as Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue, or SAFERS. In the spacewalk, they attached four environmental payloads to the Mir's docking module. Atlantis flew to Mir three times in 1997, but the last of those flights, STS-86, was in question up until its scheduled launch in September. Safety concerns arose after a Progress resupply ship collided with Mir a few months earlier during an attempted manual docking. The collision damaged the Mir's Spectre module which had to be sealed off from the rest of the station because it was losing pressure. On the day Atlantis was scheduled to launch, NASA Administrator Dan Golden summarized his decision to proceed with the flight. Not only is the Mir station deemed to be satisfac a satisfactory life support platform at this time, but it is anticipated that significant operational and scientific experience is still to be gained through continued joint operations. Atlantis docked to Mir on September 27th. Over the next six days, the crews transferred consumables, experiments, and other materials. Scott Parazinski and Vladimir Titov also conducted the first joint U.S.-Russian spacewalk, installing an external device to help seal the breach and specter from the vacuum of space. The continuous U.S. presence on Mir was preserved as astronaut Dave Wolf joined the Mir crew replacing Mike Fole, who returned to Earth on board Atlantis. In 2000, almost two years after Zarya, the first component of the International Space Station was launched from Kazakhstan, Atlantis completed a pair of missions that were crucial to the development of the ISS. During STS-101 in May of 2000, Atlantis's astronauts outfitted Zarya for the July arrival of the Zvezda service module essential for sustaining the first long-duration expedition crew. And on the mission, Atlantis became the first shuttle to employ the new advanced instrumentation display system known as the glass cockpit. On STS-106 in September 2000, Atlantis delivered supplies and Zvezda was open for business for the first time in preparation for Expedition 1, the station's first crew. Their arrival in November marked the start of a continuous human presence on board the ISS that remains unbroken. Three, 
two, one, zero, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis with Destiny. Atlantis returned to the station in February 2001 on STS-98 to deliver Destiny, the 28-foot-long U.S. Science Laboratory and centerpiece of the U.S. segment of the outpost. Destiny greatly increased the pressurized volume of the station and would be the home for scientific investigations, living and environmental control of the U.S. segment, and robotics control for the Canadarm2 robotic arm. Bob Kerbeam and Tom Jones conducted three spacewalks to help install Destiny and to relocate pressurized mating adapter number two from Unity to a temporary location on Destiny. In July 2001, Atlantis was part of another station milestone. The primary objective on STS-104 was to install the Quest airlock, the emblematic front door of the station. The airlock would become the main path to exit and re-enter the station for U.S. spacewalks. Mike Gernhardt and Jim Riley completed three spacewalks to help install and outfit Quest. The third EVA, the first ever using Quest, occurred on the 32nd anniversary of humanity's first landing on the moon. The first mission for Atlantis in 2002 was STS-110 in April, the fifth International Space Station assembly flight for Atlantis. The crew once again included Jerry Ross, making the last of his seven space flights. Using the shuttle and the station robotic arms, the combined crews installed the S-0 truss segment, the central piece of the station's integrated truss structure, the backbone of the ISS. Also delivered was the mobile transporter, a rail car-like device designed to move back and forth along the truss system. In 2003, the loss of the space shuttle Columbia and its crew prompted the grounding of the shuttle fleet for the second time in history. Following two return to flight missions by Space Shuttle Discovery designed to test safety procedures, Atlantis stood ready to support STS 115 in 2006. It's been almost four years, uh, two return to flight missions, and a tremendous amount of work by thousands of individuals to get the shuttle program back to where we are right now. And that's on the verge of restarting the station assembly sequence. We're ready to get to work. After several weather-related delays, Atlantis finally headed skyward for the STS-115 mission on September 9, 2006. The crew conducted three spacewalks to install P3, P4, critical truss segments on the port side of the station, and a pair of solar arrays. The mission also marked a milestone for the Canadian Space Agency, as astronaut Steve McLean became the first Canadian astronaut to operate both the station's robotic arm and the mobile base system in space. STS-117 in June of 2007 closely mirrored STS-115, with Atlantis and its crew delivering S3, S4, the next truss segment for the starboard side of the station and its solar arrays. The mission also included a space station crew rotation Astronaut Clay Anderson became a member of the station's Expedition 15 crew, replacing Sonny Williams, whose 195-day stay on the station set a new long-duration spaceflight record for women, eclipsing the record set by Shannon Lucid on board Mir. The sole flight for Atlantis in 2008 was STS-122 in February. The highlight of that 13-day mission was the installation of the European Space Agency's Columbus Laboratory. Astronauts Rex Walheim, Stan Love, and Hans Schlegel also replaced several components of station hardware over the course of three spacewalks. And lift off of space And in May 2009, the STS-125 mission became the first flight in nine years for Atlantis to a destination other than the International Space Station. Bypass across the board, scooter, no action. STS-125 was the final servicing mission to the Hubble Space Telescope. During the 13-day flight, the crew outfitted Hubble with two new imaging devices, 
the Cosmic Origins Spectrograph, and the Wide Field Planetary Camera 3. Over five complex spacewalks, the crew replaced and upgraded many key components on the venerable telescope, giving Hubble a new lease on life and extending its vision to beyond the limits of our solar system with a clarity once thought to be inconceivable. Atlantis has traveled more than 115 million miles in the pursuit of exploration. Its legacy enabled NASA and its international partners to accomplish some of the most complex work in human spaceflight history. Work that has yielded immeasurable benefits and allowed us to greatly advance the frontiers of knowledge.